All right, on the podcast this week, we have Jared Gaynor. Jared's been a pitching coach in the Minnesota Twins organization for the last five years. Now he's transitioning into working with pitchers in the private sector. So we go back and forth, talk about the similarities and differences in pitching and hitting. And then Jared also breaks down you know, how he goes about developing pitchers, what he's looking for on video, really good stuff. Jared's one of the best pitching coaches that that I've seen out there um, across the country. So we're lucky to have him on the podcast. Here we go, Jared Gaynor. All right, Jared, we're now live on the podcast. What's going on, man? Not a whole lot. Just got back to Arizona, settling in and moving into a new place. So it's been good. So let's see, for the past five years, you've been with the Twins organization. Um, You know, for those who don't know, I think you're still the longest standing uh, person to appear on the podcast. This might be your sixth or seventh time, but uh, had a little bit of a an absence because you were in professional baseball um, for the past five years with the Twins. Before that, you know, I think we met each other. Was that summer of 2017, I think, or 18? Maybe it was 18. 18 we were yeah. coaching together, um, college summer ball. And um, then we kind of, you know, both went into pro ball. You stayed in pro ball longer. Now you're in the private sector. I thought this would be a really fun episode to do because, you know, I don't think there's two guys out there who just solely do one thing. And, you know, I'd like to think we do it pretty well. But, you know, for you, it's solely pitching and that's what you obsess about all day long. And for me, it's it's the hitting side. But um, first off, what have you been up to in terms of the private sector? Because I know now you're transitioning into the private sector from being in pro ball. Like, what's that transition been like so far? Has it is there anything that surprised you? Have you been happy with what you've seen? Yeah, it's been good. You know, you know, obviously you coming from the pro side as well, like they're completely different animals. Um, you know, the team setting, you're working with 15 to 20 coaches or PD people. Like there's so much interaction with other people besides the players. Um, and it's really a big group effort in a sense when you're working with guys. Um, and in the private sector, especially with the way I'm doing it, I mean, it's just me. It's a solo business. Um, I'm responsible for every part of that business, which I I love, but it also can be a lot. And if you're not organized on top of things, it can get overwhelming pretty quick. Um, but I do love just the the freedom that comes with it to to try things, to experiment, um, and really try to find different ways to help players. And you know, I'm working with guys ranging from high school to professional baseball, so like there's different challenges with each of those levels. And um, I've just really enjoyed that process of being able to figure out things on my own and really try to build something from the ground up. Do you think you can help more guys out in the private sector versus when you're in a team setting in pro ball, or is it more so pro ball versus private sector because you're around them way more? Yeah. I mean, I would say probably in the private sector, you can go more wide because you can work with any age group you want. You can work with people from different organizations and teams. Um, But even in, you know, professional baseball, I mean, there's a lot of players in an organization. Now maybe you're working with one affiliate, you know, like I was a single A pitching coach. Um, so I'm working with, you know, my 15 pitchers or so. But when you think about spring training, instructional league, um, all those areas, when you have rehab guys coming with you, like you're interacting and working with a lot of players over the course of a year. Um, but I would say, you know, it's it's smaller in general and you're going deeper with very specific things with those guys. And you're just you're with them day in and day out. You're traveling with them on road trips like you spend more time with them than you do your family um, during the season. So it is it is, a I would say a little bit deeper there's maybe more relationship involved in the team setting just because that's natural like you're not going to literally talk about baseball every second you're with everybody when you're with them for 10 hours a day like you get to know them on a personal level as well not to say that you don't in the private sector um but i i do think like private sector is more okay you come you work with me we get our work in and i am trying to help you become the best baseball player you can be and then let's do it again tomorrow one of the things that i realized when i was in pro ball speaking solely from the hitting side so i'll be curious to hear what you said the pitching side, but one of the things that I thought of, I was like, man, now I see why so many guys go to people in the private sector, like, like people like us right now, because it's so hard to give every, at least from, again, speaking from the hitting side, it's so hard to give everybody the attention that they, they need um, when you're dealing with, you know, 10, 15 players. And there's so many other things that you have to do on a day to day basis. It's not solely just show up and worry about the players. Like you got to set up, you know, what's going to be early work. What's going to, how are we going to game plan as a, from a team standpoint, there's so many things you have to do and the days just fly by. So that was one of the things that, that I realized is why, I was like, now I realize why so many players do go to the private sector and get outside help 
Is that same thing true for you when you were pitching when you were a pitching coach with the Twins, or did you feel like that was it's, it's a little bit different on the pitching side? Um, I think it depends on the organization. Truthfully, like I I can't speak highly enough of the Twins as an organization. I loved working for them, and one thing I thought we did really good is making individual plans for every player. Like it wasn't just the prospects. It wasn't you know just the the top tier players in the organization. Like literally top to bottom, every single player had a plan and not even just during the season, but even during the off season, we would help them through their player plan goals. Um, we would be constantly communicating with players. Um, like each, each pitching coach, as an example, would be responsible for say eight to 10 pitchers that they would check in with during the off season. And during those conversations, they would be sending us video so we could break down their video. Um, we'd be giving them drills to do like every player had a specific plan. So we were really trying to eliminate the need for players to go to outside people in the private sector. Now, some still did. Some would still work with the likes of Tread and Driveline and, you know, and companies like that. But for the most part, we tried to provide um, everything that they would need. We would send them home with plyo balls, bands, whatever they needed from that standpoint, baseballs. Um, and then we tried to give them as detailed as a, of a plan as we could um, while they were away from us. And then, of course, we'd have, you know, mini camps for certain players throughout the, the offseason for them to come down to Florida and to work with us in person. Um, but I would say in general, just from what I've seen from you know the outside looking in and conversations with other people that i'm um, not every organization does that so there is a need for that um and i do feel like the relationship is really important from you say the coordinators or you know just the pd department with organizations and the private sector and that's what i'm hoping to be able to do now that i'm on this side of it is when i start working with professional players i want to make sure i'm having a relationship with you know whether it's their coaches or their you know their pitching coordinator with their organization and i want it to be you know, an open conversation discussion of what I'm doing with them, what they're wanting to happen and what they've seen from the player. I mean, making sure it's more of a group effort because, you know, the last thing that, you know, coordinators want or organizations want is players going off for an off season and doing something completely off the rails of what they want as an organization or what they value. Um, and I think like the more that the private sector and organizations can connect um, and work together, um, I think the better it's going to be for the player because now the player isn't conflicted on, okay, which direction should I go? Because I really like this this coach I work with in the private sector, but this organization, they're the ones that are paying me and this is the team I'm trying to get to the big leagues with. Um, so I just think that bridging that gap and that relationship between the private side and the organization um, is going to be really beneficial. And it's something that you know guys like you and me can separate ourselves from other coaches um, is building those relationships and um, and being able to do that. Do you think that organizations, pro organizations, college coaches, do you think that they they don't like the fact that their players are going to private facilities? And I'm not I know you were with the twins, so not necessarily just speaking about them. I'm just saying yep. and I I know you know a lot of other coaches and a lot of other organizations too and coordinators and things like that. Like do you think that overall they don't really like players going into different like places in the in the off season or maybe even during the season too? Yeah, uh it's interesting. I've I feel like there's a lot of things that are ego related, at least just speaking for me myself, like the instant thought is, well, why, why does he need to go somewhere else? Like, am I not providing enough for him? Am I not a good enough coach to help him? So I think like that's the first thing that coaches have to think about and check at the door. Like it's, it's really not about the coach. Like we want to guide them the best we can, but at the end of the day, whatever is best for that player, that's what the player needs to do. Um, and, and there's obviously some guidance there, like some players bounce around all over the place. They're trying to do different things, go to different facilities or going somewhere new every year or, or trying to ask other people questions constantly. So there is, you know, that guidance that needs to take place. But um, I, I would say like some coaches might not like it just because of that. It's the the fear of, you know, why, why aren't, why is what I'm doing not enough for you? Why do you feel like you need to go to another place? Um, and and that's really, I think, the main thing that's driven by the ego is just not not liking the fact that other people want to work with other coaches and, and not thinking that you're good enough. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, that that makes sense. And I, I'm sure I think we're all probably guilty of that in yeah. other areas, maybe of, of life, too, at times. But what would be something that here's here's a question I have for you, because I'm I'm curious being, you know, having been there with you and your first or second year coaching versus you know maybe this past season like what's the biggest difference in how you're coaching players now versus when you started let's just say year one in professional baseball I would say I'm a little more hands-off now than I was then and what I mean by that is 
back then when I was coaching, that was, so that was at the college level when you and me were working together. And I felt like I had to hold players' hands a lot and I had to make sure I was guiding them through a thing, whether they thought I needed to or not. That was just what I naturally wanted to do. I, I tend to be a, a little, I guess, controlling would be the word because I want to make sure things are done exactly right. They're, they're not missing a rep. They're doing it with the exact form that I want it to be done with, um, which there is a place for that, of course. Um, but I think as I've, you know, gone through the years and coached, I've gotten better at showing the players how to do things, what the expectation is, and then giving them the freedom and the trust to do that while I'm still monitoring them and watching them, but like not feeling like I have to hold their hand and guide them every step of the way. Um, especially in professional baseball, like, you know, I actually learned this a lot fr- this past year from the other pitching coach I was working with, Richard Salazar. He's He was a phenomenal coach that I got to work with this last year. And he was really big with that, with showing guys how to do things, giving them their plan, but then giving them freedom to, to execute that plan. And because at the end of the day, like, if we have to hold these players' hands every single day and, like, stay on top of them and make sure they're actually doing what's expected of them, they have no chance. It's it's going to be a really tough road for them to get to the big leagues if they're not self-driven, if they're not able to do what's asked of them and what they know they need to do to get better. Um, so I think that's that's probably the biggest change I've made is showing the plan, give a little bit of freedom, give them an opportunity to execute it, and then bringing them back in if they start to drift away. Yeah, how do you how do you know when the time is to to drift back in? I would say if they're showing consistently that like they're not executing the plan the way they should be or if um you know what I mean performance going you know going backwards would be another sign right like if we have a plan in place we have a process in place and like over a decent amount of time that the results aren't showing there obviously needs to be an adjustment that needs to be made um we talk about process all the time process is in place so that the performance ends up being good in the long run if the performance isn't good then the process probably isn't good we need to adjust that process now there obviously needs to be a considerable amount of time like you can't jump ship after one or two bad outings but um, the main purpose of a process is to lead to good results and if it's not doing that in the long run then we have to change something do you think that's applicable for younger levels too and not just professional baseball or do you think at the younger levels you need to do more hand holding and you can't just you know instruct guide and then take a step back or or can you in your opinion uh, I haven't worked with younger guys in quite a while, but I would say like naturally it's going to involve a little more hand holding just because they're younger, a little more immature and like they need more guidance and they need reminders, right? Like it takes more than just one time telling a player how to do something like they might do it right, right then. And then tomorrow they forget how to do it completely. Um, so I do think like naturally at the younger ages, you do need to be uh, more hands on, very close watching every rep. Um, but, you know, hopefully over time that that can slowly drift away and um, I want to make sure I'm making it clear too. Like, it's not like I give them a plan and I'm nowhere in sight. Like, it's just not saying something after every single rep, right? Like, it's not, oh, you did that's one thing slightly wrong. We need to adjust this on this next rep. It's giving them a couple of reps, let them try to figure it out on their own. Um, and when I need to come back in and intervene, then I will. But it's it's not feeling like you have to say something or do something every single rep. Yeah, it's, yeah. After one ball, you're like you're already like yelling out random cues to <laughs> right then they're going to throw another ball and it's probably not going to be anywhere close <laughs> <laughs> yeah what are some what are some myths when it comes to um pitching that that people like what what's some myth busting i would say from a pitching standpoint like that that you've noticed over the years well this is a big one and it's on twitter x whatever you want to call it all the time now is training velocity and stuff versus training command and for some reason, some people have it in their heads that you can only train one of them. Um, I don't know why it has to be a choice. Like they're all valuable. They're all important. Um, and I believe that you can train both of those things at the same time. We can train stuff or velocity and we can train command at the same time. Now, maybe it's not in the exact same session or the, in the exact same bullpen, um, but throughout the course of a week, like there's no doubt that we can work on all of those things. And now it comes down to just figuring out what is the lowest hitting fruit for that player. Is he a really good strike thrower, but his stuff is lacking a little bit and he doesn't strike out a lot of guys. He's given up some hard contact or is he on the other side where he throws really hard, has nasty stuff, but he just can't throw a strike. And now he's behind two Oh three one a lot and he's getting hit. So it's figuring out, okay, what is the guy's strength? And then what is the low hanging fruit, the area that we need to focus on? So let's just say command is the main focus. We're going to focus on that command, you know, let's just say, you know, hypothetically 60, 70% of the time, but that the other 30% of his training is still going to be 
on the stuff and making sure that that stuff stays locked in or making minor adjustments, you know, with even improving those things. Um, cause I do, I do believe in making strengths really big strengths and not just being slightly above average, but making what you do well, extremely well. And as outlier as we can, um, while also bringing up those, you know, those low hanging fruits. Standing closer to the plate helps strike zone coverage. Um, I think from what I've seen that actually can hurt covering the strike zone, because when I see a lot of hitters, uh, get on top of the plate. And again, there's going to be outliers, of course, but yep. when I see a lot of hitters get on top of the plate, their perception of the strike zone now changes. And so what ends up happening at times is they actually start flying open earlier because they feel the need um, to start sooner and because they are on top of the plate more to be able to hit that inside pitch. So your perception of the zone changes, your perception of speed changes a little bit too. So I'd actually make the argument that your zone or your bat is going to be in the zone for less time if you decide to scoot up on top of the plate in hopes of being able to cover, you know, the outer half pitch. Now, again, there's going to be times where that's not the case, but it's just something that, that I've seen as well. Um, and then the last thing I have is bigger and heavier bats are better. So bigger and heavier bats, this is something that I, you know, I, I hear about from time to time, not always better. There is a psychological element to it, too, uh, from a hitting standpoint. If if a if a bat, if you don't feel comfortable and confident with the bat that you're swinging, it may be the most optimal bat that there is. But if you don't have the confidence then it's not going to matter very much either. And so, like, at the end of the day, it's about hitting barrels. I'd rather give up a few mile an hour to exit velo than and hit more barrels than have the most optimal bat and not barrel up as many balls, if that makes sense. So they can be better, but I think that we kind of make the, the notion at times like, oh, I want to move up to another size. I want to move up to, you know, bigger, bigger. But does is that going to equate to more barrels? Because if not, then it's not worth it. So those are the the myths that that I have. Have you thought of any other on the pitching side and in, in, in terms of uh, maybe anything anecdotal that you you see from from pitching, whether it be on X or Twitter or maybe just uh, throughout your own coaching journey? Any anyone that is going to go uh, get people really fired up? Like I know my situational hitting one will. <laughs> uh, I don't know if it'll get anybody super fired up, but I see sometimes when I hear people talk like they think good mechanics will equate to more strikes. And I, number one, we have to define what good mechanics are um, because that means something completely different to everybody. Um, Number two, I've seen people throw with what I would consider horrible mechanics, but they can throw strikes because they are really repeatable within what they do. So I don't think that having optimal mechanics necessarily leads to better command or more strikes, but I do think being consistent within, you know, a certain range of your own delivery can lead to more strikes. Like I look at my own, my own self when I pitched in college, looking back now, my delivery was awful. I'm like, it's no wonder I didn't throw hard. Um, and what was, what was bad about it though? About my delivery. Yeah. No force from my back leg. Like I was very pushy. Didn't, didn't load into my backside very well. Opened up the, the trunk a little early. Um, but I found a way to be consistent with the way I did throw and as a result, I was able to throw strikes just because I practiced it so much. And just that delivery, even though it wasn't optimal, or maybe I was not able to throw as hard or whatever because of my delivery, because I was very consistent within the mechanics that I did have, and there wasn't a ton of variance, I was able to throw a lot of strikes and, and not walk people. So um, that's, that is just something I, I see all the time. Guys are like constantly trying to clean up their delivery because they think it's going to lead to more strikes, which maybe it will more efficient mechanics for you and, and whatnot are going to lead to better stuff and, and maybe more repeatable, repeatable delivery. Um, but I don't think it guarantees it. So that's a big one is, is just not thinking that fixing your mechanics is going to solve all of your problems. Mm. What have you noticed in, like helps players improve their pitching mechanics that has nothing to do with strength training? Uh, well, it's in the same arena, but more of just improving movement capability right like if i'm restricted in certain parts of my body whether it's my hips my t-spine my shoulders whatever it is i'm going to be limited on the way i can move and i'm going to really have a tough hill to climb if i'm just giving them drills to do that they physically can't do or trying to put them in positions that they physically can't get into um so whether that's a strength thing or not like i think that's more on the movement side um you know learning how to hinge well learning how to do single leg stuff well um rotating well 
um, from the hips, the T-spine, all those things. Like I think just improving movement quality um, is probably the biggest bang for your buck while also integrating the drills that you're doing. So a lot of the drills that I like to do um, also help improve those movements. So like a lot of pre-throwing stuff I do don't even involve plyo balls. They're just, they're hinge-based drills, single leg type work, medicine ball stuff that is working on certain movement patterns. And then I'll blend that into throwing drills that are essentially a throwing version of some of those drills that we're doing. Um, but the focus is really on like the movement capability. And you think the movement capability is something that you have to like what get do a physical screen on on a player first? Like, how would you guys go about doing that? Well, maybe you don't want to exactly say exactly how the twins would do it. But how do you go about determining yeah. whether a player can can get into certain positions or not? I do a movement assessment. Um, it's. 10 or 11 different movements exercises that are similar to what they'll need to do on the field. Um, they're not perfect, right? Like I don't think any assessment is perfect because it's not actually being done in their throwing delivery, right? Like some people you can see them do a movement screen looks horrible and then they get on the mound and their delivery appears to look really, really good. Um, so it's really just a starting point for me. And I kind of try to connect the dots between that and say something I see in their delivery. Let's just say, the guy cannot load into his back leg at all. Like his hinge capability does not appear to be good on the mound. And then I'll test something in the screening. I'll be like, okay, that's showing up right here. I see that exactly in the screen. Like he just, he's physically not able to sit back and load into his back, his back hip well enough. Um, so it's things like that, or like, you no, know, really, I, I would say the hip internal rotation and external rotation, I, that usually lines up pretty well in the movement screen and in their pitching delivery. Um, I can see that in various ways. Um, like just for example, I was working with a guy a couple of weeks ago and um, he was someone that I know. So like we weren't doing like an official screen or we weren't doing an official um, program. It was more of just like, I was kind of giving him some advice on what I saw. And after looking at the video, I essentially was guessing to myself what I was going to see on his movement screen with his hips. And it lined up exactly right. So there are certain things that are going to be pretty obvious and clear to see between the two, but there's going to be other areas that maybe they're a little unclear. That makes sense to me. Yeah. That's something that I've thought about too, is like from a hitting standpoint, like, does it make more sense for me to just watch video of them and see, you know, what positions they're not getting in or to do a movement screen and it not, you know, maybe they're stiff that day or maybe they have it, you know, there's so many just variables that go into like kind of identifying and finding that root cause that like, as you said, it pointed out that there's, it's not the best, but there's just, you know, you need, you need some sort of system. Um, all right, let's talk about uh, our own personal philosophies when it comes to to pitching and hitting. So I'll, I'll go first, and we'll, how about we start out and go, what you're looking for when you first watch a, a, a player on video. So for me, I think from a, a mechanical standpoint, a hitting mechanical standpoint, I think it's so easy to be so confused on on social media or just in general if you're talking with coaches on you know what you should be looking for or um, it, you know a player like what maybe like if you're explaining it to a player i think it's very simple we overcomplicate everything so the only things i look for i'll look for you know first thing is the setup right their their stance i i like to refer to it as a setup more than anything so it's their setup their gather so it should be called the called their load forward move launch position and then swing so i'll break those down a little bit so the setup it's balance is very, very important. I think one of the coaches that I think does a really good job and he's pretty dogmatic about it, which I think is a really good thing is, is Doug Latta from a balance standpoint, he, cause he's a hundred percent, right? Like you have to start in balance and move in balance um, in order to, to help you be on time. And that starts in your setup position from a, a gather standpoint. There's, there's so many, there's different trains of thought, but you can pretty much tell like, okay, are you loading to your quad? Are you, are you actually like coiling into that back hip? Um, so, I mean, it's, that's pretty simple too. forward move. This is where a lot of issues I actually see because players will come out of that front back hip too early. They'll start to lose posture and their torso ends up standing up a little bit more coming out of hip hinge. Um, they'll start to lose sometimes connection with their back being connected to their, their back shoulder and lose that back scap at times too. And then you'll see them also during the forward move, you'll see they won't maintain that back heel connection and, um, and that'll cause them to be in an awkward position in the launch position. And then, you know, obviously by the time they're actually rotating during the swing, there are some things to look for too, but 
the reason why I wanted to lay it out like that is there's really just five different elements. And then within those elements, like there's some room for variability and there's some, there's some room to, to make it a little bit more individualized, if you will, especially in the setup um, position. But that that's kind of what I look for from on a video standpoint, it's set up, gather forward, move, launch position, which is where, when the front foot lands and then the actual swing and contact. What about you? It's similar. I mean, I feel like there's a lot of similarities with hitting and pitching and similar to you. Like I start at the very beginning and then I work my way down the rest of the delivery because it's, it's a domino effect. Um, Randy Sullivan, I think I heard him say this at a conference a couple years ago. You have to get the first move right. Like that's, that's where it starts, right? And it has a domino effect on the rest of the delivery. So from a pitcher standpoint, the setup is part of it. And then really the, the main first thing I look at is their leg lift. So when they go into their leg lift, what does their back foot look like? Is it stable? Is it sliding out? Are the toes coming up? Because you really need to have a stable foundation on that back leg. So with that, I'm looking at what that foot position is. What does the lead leg do? How much kind of rotation are they getting? Um, that can also tell me if they're getting too much based off of what their back foot does. I'm um, just as an example, let's say the guy's heel slides out. So if they're flush up against the rubber and their heel starts to slide out away from the rubber as they go into their leg lift, there's a chance that they're getting too much counter rotation into their leg lift. Because in order for that foot to stay in place as I counter rotate, it's going to require some hip internal rotation to be able to hold that and to stay stable. Um, so by the heel sliding out, that's that's the body's way of compensating and finding a comfortable position. Um, so that's the first thing I like to look at is just what is that foot position. After that, we go into the stride and the load. So I look at the their hinge and just what their loading pattern looks like. From there, are they rotating into foot plant um, or are they pushing into foot plant? Um, arm action. So throughout that process, obviously the arm is doing its um, its motion during this process. So I'm looking at certain positions that the arm is getting in and then it's stride foot contact. Where is the arm at from, um, from a rotation standpoint? Um, is it late? Is it down here? Is the arm up? Is it on time? Elbow flexion. Where is that at at stride foot contact? And then from there, um, I'm also looking at the trunk. How, what position is the trunk in? Is it opened up too early? Is it closed? Is it extended to where the ribs are flaring up and their back is arched? Um, and then, of course, after ball release, rot or sorry, after foot plant, um, rotating into ball release, what does that lead leg pattern look like? And then what does their deceleration look like with the upper body? Can you use any pieces of technology? Is there any piece of technology that you feel you have to have when it comes to evaluating a player? Mechanically? Um, yeah. I don't think there's anything you have to have. Now, does it help? Absolutely. Um, what, what would be something that helps? Motion capture. If you have motion capture, because now I can see where are you in space as you're moving down the mound from a rotational standpoint um, and just what positions are you in throughout the delivery um, from a degree standpoint, um, which can be helpful. Um, force production is really helpful. So you know, when I was with the Twins, we had a force plate mound, so I was able to use that data with guys um, on a regular basis, as well as motion capture, um, we had that at our stadium. So I was getting every everything you can imagine from evaluating mechanics um, in professional baseball. So there I got very used to using that information to help impact decisions when working with players. Um, but I still think there's a lot you can see with video. Um, from a force standpoint, I, mean, I really can't see how much force you're producing, obviously, without having a force plate mound. But because I've seen it so many times, like I have a good idea of the way you're moving down the mound, whether you're producing enough force or not, if that makes sense. Um, I can't give you specific numbers on where they're at, um, but I have a good idea based off of um, just the positions they're getting into and the way they're moving down the mound from that standpoint. Um, and there is, I mean, there's now like there's ProPlay AI, there's the Mustard app, there's those types of things from um, the motion capture type stuff, the marker list stuff. The accuracy, I don't know how accurate those devices are at this point. Um, I, I think they're a little ways away from being super accurate. Um, but if I had something, you know, like Qualysis is another one that that some places, I think Tread has Qualysis and maybe some other places. Um, like that's a pretty good motion capture system that some private facilities have. Um, so if I was able to get that, like that would be very valuable. But obviously when I'm working with players at this point, um, you know, I don't have access to that type of stuff. So I have to use video. I have to be able to use what I've learned over the years and being able to match that up with what I'm seeing with my eyes. Well, you, you have TrackMan and Edgertronic, right? Yep. Yeah. So that helps. So obviously TrackMan, that's now we're getting into pitch movement and the way the ball is um, spinning and, and moving essentially. So I'm able to get all of that data, which is extremely helpful. 
Edgertronics is great for impacting those pitch development plans on how we're going to make the adjustment to get more movement or whatever adjustment we're trying to make. Um, and then, of course, I can use the Edgertronic for looking at the delivery and getting really high speed um, video of their mechanics. And that allows me to not skip all these frames that a regular phone might have to where I, maybe I'm missing certain parts from, you know, just before foot plant to after foot plant. There's certain things that the phone just can't necessarily pick up. So the Edgertronic is, is definitely better for me getting um, more accuracy on where exactly they are in space and knowing, okay, when is their foot exactly touching the ground versus not? That makes sense. So how do you utilize the track band? Like if I, if I came to you and, you know, doing a pitching session for the very first time, what are you looking for on there? And then mm -hmm. based upon like what you're, what you find, like, how would you determine if I needed to change anything or, or what should I be changing? Well, if it was your very first time, there would be very little instruction on the pitch development side of things. It'd be more of an evaluation that first time. So I would have you throw all of your pitches on it, um, just say 20 to 25 pitch bullpen. I'd get all of your data. I'd then look at that um, and then come up with a plan because um, everyone's different, right? It's not like I'm trying to get everybody to throw the exact same slider or the exact same change up. They're, they're all going to be different based off of where your starting point is. So if you're more of a north south guy, so let's just say you have four seam fastball, it has some carry, depthy curveball, change up, or you're an east west guy where you're throwing more sinkers and sliders, that will impact the type of pitches I think we need to develop. Or wherever that pitch is at, do we need to improve it, right? Like let's just say you're a north south guy and you throw a curveball and that curveball just really isn't that depthy and it's not very hard. It's probably a pitch either we need to add velocity or we're going to try to get a little bit more depth on to create more separation between your fastball and that curveball or east west guy maybe your sinker um, really isn't sinking that much but you throw from you know a semi lower slot and it's nine ten inches of induced vertical break um, that would probably be a focus of trying to get you down closer to five inches just as an example um, so really trying to figure out where is that starting point and then can we maximize those pitches um, to make them the best version of themselves What's what's been a pitcher you've been you've worked with and you don't have to name names if you want to, but he's made significant changes in their movement plots. And then it also equated to them pitching significantly better out on the field, too. Um, yeah, I won't give names just in case they don't want me to say their name. But um, one player I worked with, we drafted him in 2021. Um, he was a later round pick. I had him in 21 after we drafted him and then I had him in 22 as well. Um, he threw four seam, a slider, and a changeup. Mm -hmm. His four seam average carry didn't have a ton of BB. He cut it quite a bit. Um, his slider was big. It was it was a sweepy slider, um, but it was really slow. And then his changeup was just kind of non-existent. Um, and we were able to actually clean up the four seam a little bit without raising the slot to where we increased some efficiency on it. He was able to get carry, so he was like up in the 17, 18 inch range, which is respectable. Um, the slider, we we kept the slider that he had because it was really big um, and he could throw it for strikes really well. And then we just added um, a harder, shorter slider to bridge the gap between the sweepy one and his fastball. Um, so he was a guy that was 90 to 93. The slider was like 74 to 76, which is pretty slow. Um, so we added a harder one that was a little bit less movement um, around like 5 VB, 3 to 5 HB. Um, and it was 84, 85, which was great. Um, and then we, he also was able to add a changeup um, that had a lot of movement, actually. He just couldn't throw for a strike at first. But once he started to figure it out, it ended up becoming a really good weapon for him. But, like, it's down to zero inches or one inch of induced vertical break. Um, it's a really, really good pitch for him. Um, and this was a guy, like, when we first drafted him, like, there wasn't a ton that was special about him. He's right-handed, didn't throw hard. His slider was good. It was just slow. Um, and now he's turned himself into um, a pretty special pitcher. And he's actually, so I didn't work with him this year because he was at a higher level, um, but he added a sinker now too. So he's throwing sinkers to righties and he's throwing his four seam to lefties. Um, and he's turned into a, a really, really good pitcher. And with his work ethic, like I have no doubts that he can make it to the big leagues. You mentioned he's, he had a sinker this year. So at what point should pitchers be thinking about adding certain pitches to their um, arsenal? Yeah, um, I think performance will will dictate that right like so for him his fastball like the, the movement ended up being pretty good like the carry was really good on it he just wasn't getting good results with it it was getting hit pretty hard wasn't getting a lot of miss on it um, given he doesn't throw crazy hard like he's in has average velocity for a right-handed pitcher 
Um, but we really just needed something um, different for righties, especially. So and that's where that sinker came in. And he essentially became like a combo pitcher to where if he was facing a lefty, he pitched it more like he was a north-south guy. And then against righties, he would pitch more like an east-west guy. So where he was throwing more sinkers and he was throwing his sweepy slider off of it. So that's that's uh, probably the the thing that's you know coming with a lot of players. And like I've, I'm seeing this just in pro ball now and with you know watching other organizations and seeing what they've done with some of their guys like it's giving them giving their pitchers weapons to lefties and righties not just giving them one plan of attack that they use with both sides which some pitchers still do that which can work for some guys um, but some guys they they need a different plan of attack depending on who they're facing just because you know there's there's pretty heavy platoon splits you know usually right on right guys if you're a east west guy you're going to dominate them but if you're facing a lefty with that same mix usually lefties hit the east west profile pretty well so it's just being able to combat that and finding new strategies. How do you go about game plan against a hitter? Like, is there a certain hitter that you tell pitchers game plan against or maybe other coaches that you've talked talked with about game plan against a certain hitter that you went about differently? Like, I think one of the things that I always find interesting on the, on the pitching side is how pitchers don't realize like how hard hitting is and you could tell tell them exactly what pitch is coming and most of the time they still can't hit it but yeah everybody's still like worried about like facing this hitter versus that hitter yeah no you're exactly right and i think it's level dependent right so when i was in single a we did do an advanced report but we weren't going over every single hitter because that's just unnecessary like number one there's not enough data on most of the hitters at that level um, and number two like just being honest, not all of those hitters are that good. Like it's not worth going over them. Like if the pitcher pitches to his strengths, he's going to get them out probably as long as he gets ahead and, and executes. And that's really the case with most hitters. And so we're getting to the top tier players. Like if a pitcher executes his plan and gets ahead, the odds are in his favor. Like he's, he's going to be successful for the most part. Um, so, but to get them used to that process and like, especially as they climb the ladder and get to higher levels and especially the big leagues, like, we would go over a couple batters, um, whoever the top players were on those teams. And um, it was more of just educating on what to look for. Um, and then, but also making sure we're not pulling away from what our strengths are as pitchers, because we never want to deviate from that. It just might change our usage of the way we use our pitches in that at bat. Um, but at the end of the day, like I'm not going to become a completely different pitcher for this one specific hitter. I'm just going to use my pitches a little bit differently, depending on what that batter's strengths are. If it's someone that we want to make sure doesn't beat us. Why don't more pitchers throw inside? Uh, well, it's actually interesting. I was looking at some college data um, a little while back. And if you look at the heat maps of fastballs, it is bright red away. And there's a couple of reasons why pitchers do that, I think, in college. Number one is the umpires are consistently calling pitches about this far off the plate. So if you think about it as a hitter, if they're getting this far off the plate for strikes, like, that's going to be really tough to hit because the second I now going back to what you said, getting on the plate to cover the outside part of the plate. If I'm a pitcher that has semi good commander has confidence in myself, if I see a batter scooting on the plate because he sees I'm living away. Now I do have an opportunity to go in to jam them really bad. And then that's going to teach him to respect that you're not afraid to go inside. Um, but I just think pitchers live away so much, especially at the college level is just because they're getting strikes called off the plate. And frankly, actually, I'm pretty sure the numbers, even in college, they're still better with fastballs away. Like fastballs away is better for a pitcher than fastballs inside from a performance standpoint. Um, but going inside is still beneficial because it's going to set up your off-speed pitches and everything else away. So it's not like you can live away, um, but for the majority of the time, like fastballs away, they, they do perform better at the college level compared to inside fastballs. What about at the professional level? That's a good question. I actually don't know, like off the top of my head, um, just on average, if away is better than inside. Um, I think it just kind of depends on the pitcher's profile too. So we going back to the East West stuff, like if it's a sinker guy versus a cutter guy or a carry forcing guy, they're going to live in different quadrants of the zone. Um, so I think like that's the biggest thing is knowing the way your pitches move and how they perform and where those pitches are going to play the best. So it should be a little bit more of an individual standpoint, but I think college coaches, because as you know, college coaches call pitches um, and just, for whatever reason, for years and years, it's been no matter what, throw that fastball down and away or middle away um, and, and live out there. And we'll take our chances on them hitting that ball. Have you ever looked into Perry Husband at all in effective velocity? 
Um, I've I've looked at his stuff a little bit. He's been around for a few, or he's been around for longer than a few years. But <laughs> I started like, a long time. Started looking at his stuff. I would say, yeah, I don't know, six years ago. Or so I can't say that I really pay much attention to it at this point. Um, but I know you had him on your podcast not that long ago, right? Yeah, I had him on the podcast. That's why I was kind of curious what what you thought. And then, um, you know, my biggest takeaway is just you know the the hitter's perception of you know how fast the the ball is on an inside pitch versus out on the outer half. And um, I thought it was pretty interesting. I was just curious if if that was something that you had looked into and um, had done like any game planning based upon anything that that he had talked about. Uh, no, I can't say that I have. I think it's good stuff. I I can't say I've, it's impacted any of my you know, game plan or decision making. Where do you see the future of pitching development going in the next five to 10 years? I think it's just going to get more and more um, technology based, right? Like we're already in an era where there's tons of technology, but I think it's only going to become more. Um, And not only is it going to become more, but I think it's just going to get better, right? As time goes on, the accuracy of the technology is going to be better. We're going to learn more information. So like going back to motion capture systems, I think it's going to be a more accurate for, you know, even just using something like your phone. I think it's going to be a more reliable resource to use some of these apps that are out there. And any coach can be in the cage that you're in right now, filming a hitter or filming a pitcher, and they're going to be able to get instant information um, that is not only, you know, there, but it's actually good and it's, it's usable. Um, I just think just the way some of these companies are moving, like that's the direction it's going. Um, so I just think it's, it's just going to keep going in that direction and we're going to learn more information and um, baseball kind of goes, it kind of goes full circle, right? Like the things that are important kind of remain important and we focus on different areas for a little bit of time. So like on the pitching side of things, for example, um, fastball vertical break was a huge craze, you know, a few years ago, like, Oh, we got, we got to get more carry on this guy's pitcher and people were changing their arm slots to do it. They were doing all this stuff to do it. And then a couple of years later realized, okay, well maybe some guys should have carry like carry is good for some guys, but manipulating their arm slot and those things might not be beneficial and sinkers are still valuable. So like, we don't want to, you know, completely get rid of those pitches. And then, so things kind of come full circle. So we learn a little bit, we adapt, we experiment, we try new things. And then we realize, okay, some of this was good, but not all of it was good. Some of this from years ago that we were doing is still applicable. Let's still take some of that. And it's just this constant cycle of growing and getting better and using old information that has been available for years and years and years and just learning from that and adding on to it and making things a little bit better and applying it in a slightly different way. Um, and I just think that that's kind of the cycle that baseball is going to continue in. Um, is as we're getting new information, we're going to learn new things. We're going to try new things. We're going to figure out what works, what doesn't work. And it's just going to be this evolving cycle um, of moving forward. What are your thoughts yeah, on I, that? I would agree with that on the hitting side too. I, I, it's not going anywhere, but I think everything's going to be simplified. Like we're going to have access and the technology is going to get so good that it's going to allow um, coaches to just simplify everything in a much more digestible manner for players. And so I, I think it's, it's exciting for sure. I mean, I, I do love the, the, I do love technology, but I also think on, even like on the mental side, I think you're going to see some, some different things and people just continuing, not that they haven't already, but just continuing to, um, look down, you know, the, the mental performance and, you know, working with different coaches and, um, you know, that's something for me on the hitting side, like I think every hit coach needs to um, have the knowledge and understanding of, of how the the human mind works and be able to, to help hitters like I don't think it should be something like yeah let's just send them to a site you know um, somebody else who specializes in that like I think as a hitting coach you need to be the one who specializes in that because so much of hitting is psychological so you need to to understand all that and um, so I think from that standpoint, that's just that information is going to continue to become more digest digestible. And I think, uh, you know, doing different studies with EEG and things like that, too, I think will be interesting and will be able to um, help players more. So I agree with you overall. I think uh, it's not going anywhere. It's just going to continue to uh, be amplified, but it's going to be a lot simpler, if that makes sense. It does. Yeah. Cause I feel like whenever something new comes, it, it kind of has to be complicated at first, just because you're still learning it and you're trying to teach other people how to use it and the value of things. Um, and just trying to get buy-in from the baseball community on some of these things. And it takes time to build that. 
Um, and the more you do something, the more advanced it gets, the better you get at it, it the easier it is to simplify it. So um, I, I totally agree. And um, I'm excited for the future. I know some people aren't. Some people don't like the way the game is going right now. Um, and it's, it is, Rodriguez. yeah, it's, <laughs> it is a little frustrating, um, seeing some stuff online. Like I would love your take on, on some of that stuff. I feel like I see it mostly with hitting stuff. Um, like whether it's people posting videos, making fun of drills people are doing, which I just, I just don't get that. Um, you know, whether you agree with something or not, like, I think at the end of the day, every coach is doing the best they can with the information they have. And they're trying to help their players the best they can. Um, I tend to give people the benefit of the doubt. Now, some people, obviously, there's always people that that don't. They have bad motives or they they're unwilling to learn new things. Um, but that's part of what I want to do. Like, you know, when I first started pitching coach, you, um, I initially had the plans of it being strictly for coaching education. Like, I had no intentions of actually using it to help players. Um, my main uh, my main goal originally was to impact coaches and be an educational platform for coaches so that they could impact their players. And just over time, it kind of morphed into being both players and coaches. And um, I just have had too many players reach out um, over the months to to not work with them and to not help them. Um, so now it's shifted into a coaching and player educational platform. Um, but coaching is like I do have a passion for helping coaches because so many coaches have helped me. I would not be where I am today or know the stuff I know if it wasn't for many, many coaches who were willing to have conversations with me, teach me things sit down with me when I didn't understand things or things didn't make sense. And they were patient with me. Like I want to be able to be that voice for other coaches. And that's why it's just frustrating to see some of the stuff you see online of, of coaches putting other coaches down. Well, and it's, it's also ironic because, you know, they'll, they'll say what they're those coaches who are putting other people down are saying that they're, they're trying to help grow the game. <laughs> I mean, by, exactly. by putting other people down. Oh, interesting. You're trying to help grow the game by putting other people down. And I mean, I see stuff every day. I don't, agree with but i can't i just don't can't imagine why you would actually go and screen grab a a drill and then post it and then tag eight or ten different other coaches um trying to you know embarrass that that coach who's probably just trying to just help out the the kid i think it goes down to just you know it's just human behavior though it's not going to change it's uh people want to uh it's a status game and status life um unfortunately too and um you know money is always involved which anytime that's involved things things can go sideways so i think it's a combination of all that stuff um i think hitting is like politics everyone has an opinion and everyone wants to make sure that their opinion is heard and i think that's it's the unfortunate truth of it is this hitting is very similar to politics i don't see that as much on the pitching side i see it a little bit um but yeah, if I had to do it over again, I would become a pitching coach. <laughs> there you go. That was well said. I like the way you put that. Um, one thing I wanted to say but uh, before we wrap up here is uh, any advice you would give to – this wasn't even on the show notes page. I, I, it's, I just something I just thought of. Any advice you would give to somebody who wants to build something online for uh, – I, I, as a – as a brand or as, um, you know, a platform like that, maybe they're even starting their own business in baseball. Like just any advice you have, because I think what you've done over the past 12 months has been like really inspiring and cool to see from, you know, from my side of things. I mean, I don't know exactly when you started pitching coach you on, on Twitter, but I think it was around this time last year. So in 12 months, you went from zero to 12 or I'm sorry, from zero to over 20,000 followers up to this this point, Um, 10,000 email subscribers, um, you know, have people flying in now to work with you. So, I mean, you've really, and you did all this while, while while being a a dad to a newborn baby and having a young family and and everything else. So I'm curious to, uh, to hear what you, what, you have to say in terms of what advice you would give to somebody else who is just starting out and and wants to get to where you're at right now. Well, I appreciate everything you just said. Um, Two, I have two main things and I'll elaborate on them. Um, The first one is consistency. So if you look over the last 12 months or 11 months, whatever it's been, um, I haven't missed a single day of tweeting. Um, I have tweeted at least once a day, usually two to three times a day. And I've written a newsletter every single Monday for the last 
43 weeks. So I started the newsletter January 2nd or something like that. And it's been every single Monday since then. And I learned that through people like you, um, Justin Welsh, who's not in the baseball space, but he's in the, the business side of things. And he's been a really big help to me in growing things. And that's one of the things that he preaches is just consistency. Every single day, tweet. If you commit to a newsletter, don't miss a week. Do it every single week. And then you just, you get in the habit and now you're, you're learning through these tweets. And because of all these tweets I'm doing, I'm getting interaction from other people that are interested in it. And over that course of time, you kind of figure out what are people actually interested in, right? Like I, early on, I'd post stuff and I'd get one like, I wouldn't get anything on it. And then I'd post something else literally the next day and it would get a hundred plus likes or interactions. And it's like, okay, I'm sort of figuring out what do people actually care about in the baseball community? Um, Cause I, you know, I, I think there's a blend of being able to post stuff that you're passionate about, but you also want to give people what they're actually seeking and what they want to learn. Um, and over the course of tweeting every single day for the last year, I have a very good idea of what people actually care about. And it's kind of interesting. It's not necessarily the things that I thought they would care about as much. Um, and without a doubt, the number one thing that I get interaction on is when I post something mechanical. People love mechanics. <laughs> I it, it caught me off guard. I really, like, I knew people liked pitching mechanics, but I didn't know they liked them that much. Like it is by far my most popular contact anytime I post mechanical things. Um, and I didn't know that. And I wouldn't know that if I didn't tweet consistently for a year. Um, so that's, that's the main thing is be consistent. Obviously you got to be learning and growing. Like if you're not posting good stuff, no one's going to follow you. So um, it's trial and error. Don't be afraid to start. Like that's just start at the end of the day. Number two, oh, go ahead. Yes, I'm no, 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 no. Number two, and this is one of the most important things as well, is having the right people in your corner and having mentors. So for me, like you're one of my best friends, but you're also a mentor to me. And I know that like if I have an idea, a thought, anything, like you're the first person I think of to text about that idea and you'll be you'll give me honest feedback. Like I remember I'd send you a thread that I wrote and yeah, you would you were you would never be afraid to tell me, oh, make this adjustment. Like, yeah, you probably don't need that or you would ask for clarification, like you would approach it like you were someone that didn't know anything about pitching and you would help me simplify, you know, or, you know, figure out a better message or a better point. Um, and then, of course, having, you know, other mentors, whether it's other coaches, having people on social media that you follow, like, like I said, like Justin Welsh, not a baseball guy, but I would not be I would not have the page I have without his inspiration because I have used a lot of stuff from his playbook, his courses um, and then other people similar to him with similar accounts. Um, Alex Ramosi really big fan of the stuff that he does. He's helped me. I know you've, you've um, learned from him as well. Um, so like, those are probably the two biggest things. Like if you want to start a business, you want to, you know, grow, just say a social media account, um, consistency, and then mentors. Like those are two of the biggest things. Yeah. Great advice right there. I, I tell you what, I remember when you started pitching coach you and, and everything you just said, I mean, I, I'm the same way. I think Justin Welsh is, I know, I think we both uh, got that course and it, it's helped us immensely um, from just, you know, understanding content and, and things like that. But I remember when you started pitching coach you and I didn't really know what you wanted to, to do with that. And I was kind of like, Oh yeah, great. Like, you know, you know, hope it works out. And then one day, uh, you'd been tweeting for a little bit. And I was like, I just like, clicked on it randomly at your profile. I was like, you, you're already, you were already at like seven or 8,000 followers. And I was like, I, I was expecting to see like a thousand followers at that point. And I was like, man, that's crazy. But I, uh, I, I think a hundred percent too, like you need people to be honest with you. Like that's something I, I always, if someone's going to ask me for my feedback, like I'm, I'm going to be honest. I may not be right. But I'm going to give you my honest opinion because I think the worst thing that happens is people just tell you kind of what you want to hear to make you feel good. Right. But that doesn't actually help the person. And so if you actually care about the person, and similar to coaching too, right? I mean, if a player comes to you and if you just tell them like, oh, yeah, great job. Like, keep it going. You know what I mean? When in reality, like they maybe they need them, you know, you need to get on them a little bit or something like that, too. So that's it for me. But where can... Where can people contact you, reach out to you? As I said, I know people, I mean, uh, you know, are already like flying out to come see you in this off season now that you're in the private sector full time. Um, so, I mean, what what's a way for someone to to connect with you to, to learn more? Yeah, um, my website is pitchingcoachu.com. Um, and that's also my Twitter handle. Like those are the two biggest things. Um, I have my DMs open on Twitter. So even if I don't follow, or even if you don't follow me, or I don't follow you, you can still DM me. Um, I'm usually pretty responsive. I 
I do my best to respond to every single person that messages me. So that would probably be the easiest thing. And then I can figure if I need to give you my phone number through there, I can do that. Um, but yeah, website and, and Twitter would be the two biggest things. Awesome, dude. We'll have to do this again. Uh, man, dude, we've already been recording for over an hour. It's crazy, but appreciate you coming on, dude. Good seeing you as always. Awesome. Thanks, Pat.